In the aftermath of E3's cancellation, Microsoft have hit the ground running with their take on the inevitable live streams that we've all been expecting. With their first of many streams apparently, they've given us a nice cheeky peek at some of their upcoming titles. Those familiar with the channel will know that we're predominantly PC focused, but games will always come before platform, and to ignore another market in your industry is never a good idea. Just ask Toys R Us. This show has almost all been about the games, with reveals aplenty and lots to look forward to, and considering that for a full generation we've been trying to get Xbox to understand that they don't have to keep trying to sell us a console if they just release some damn games on the thing, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. I mean, this bodes well for the future, and I'm looking forward to see what first party offerings they've got on the table further down the line, as the likelihood of those ones hitting the PC is much higher these days. So anyway, let's dive in. Speaking of diving in, we swim straight into our first piece of mysterious gameplay footage. This is Bright Memory Infinite. My initial reactions being that it looked kind of familiar, be it the tangible looking guns or the grim lighting or something, I don't know. It was giving me Crisis or Titanfall vibes, especially when they started war running. So I was watching this trying to figure out what it could be. I do like the look of the abilities, and with the melee attack, ground slams and all that mobility, it felt a little rage too at times, and the grapple in particular looked very reminiscent of the whip in Bulletstorm. Then a Roman turned up, and I lost track of everything, and I'd definitely given up when both versions of the Gadget Mobile turned up and started having a battle, so it was created by FYQD Studio, which is one guy in his spare time. Touted as being a lightning fast fusion of FPS and action genres, it's said that you can combine a wide variety of skills and abilities to unleash dazzling combo attacks. So a little research dug out that this was initially a project intended to be released episodically. Episode 1 has actually been available in early access on Steam since January 2019. Not only that, it had a formal release just over a month ago on the 26th of March. Now I won't go too much into the story having only just heard of it, but it's set in 2036 in a sprawling futuristic metropolis. There's this scientifically unexplained phenomenon going on, which is tied to some form of archaic mystery. This does seem to be a bit more gameplay focused however, although I may be talking out of school as I am very new to this thing. So the developer has said that because it was difficult to foresee just how well it would sell, he created it initially as kind of almost like a demo and intended to use crowdfunding support to develop it further. He says he now has all the time and funding, and I'm guessing with this being announced at an Xbox reveal event he's had a little, shall we say, third party assistance. So all of the story and the stages are being reworked, but the action and the general gameplay will remain as is. Now in a nice little touch, although Bright Memory Episode 1 won't be developed any further, he is planning on making regular experimental editions, and these will be new features for existing players to try. And then when Bright Memory Infinite is complete, and I quote, Those who have already purchased Bright Memory Episode 1 will receive a special 100% off discount coupon for Bright Memory Infinite prior to release. Which is nice. Gotta be honest, I'm actually thinking of picking episode 1 up, although be warned, if you haven't guessed by this point, this is a short experience. Apparently it averages out at about 48 minutes for a straight playthrough, and just shy of 2.5 hours for a completionist run. But at £7.19, or 10 of those American buckaroos at the time of recording, might be worth forking out just to take it for a spin. Anyway, on to our next game. We saw some Dirt 5, which isn't really my thing, but I'm always happy to see Codemasters, who I've been a fan of since Micro Machines. So it's a continuation of the Dirt series, and it's going to involve some globe trotting, with the game's development director, Robert Karp, stating that New York, Norway, China, Brazil, Italy, and Arizona are all locations in the game. It's also going to incorporate weather systems, creating different experiences. Now, this does sound very Forza Horizon 4, although here it might be more customizable rather than more situational, like in Horizons Change seasons for example. There's apparently a wide range of vehicles including rallies, buggies and these nifty sounding sprint cars. There'll also be 4 player split screen which I believe is new, with customizable events making it nice and flexible. The career mode is supposed to give you more agency and choice than previous games in this series, with you signing up to real world sponsors and making decisions along the way. Now the career will also feature voiceover work by both Troy Baker and Nolan North, which I have to admit is my main takeaway. Those two facing off against each other in the booth always leads to some hilarity or just some flat out great performances, so this should be fun. And on to game number three! Now I hadn't noticed at the time that our next title wasn't a premiere, so this one was a little confusing at first, with my initial reactions ranging from is this an alien game to this is an alien game, down to the damn Promethean heads on the walls, and the extremely HR Geiger looking sexualised biomechanics everywhere. It wasn't actually until Scorn hit the screen that I thought, wait, I, I know this, I thought this was released. I think I had it in my mind in category with Agony from 2018, but this was announced back in 2014, 
and it's nice to see it's finally getting somewhere. You see, this isn't your run-of-the-mill military shooter. Yeah, it's first person, but it's a horror adventure title, and the press material repeatedly talks about self-awareness and immersion. It says you've got full body control, and the examples given are things like having to manually operate actual controls on machines and things like that. Now this could end up being a bit like VR controls, then again, could end up a bit quop. We'll just have to see. In game number four, we have Corv's Rise of One, or Chorus, as they claim it's called, despite insisting on spelling it Corv's. Yeah, anyway, this was revealed, and to be honest, I haven't much to say about this one. It looks to be being developed by Fish Labs and published by Deep Silver. Fish Labs have been responsible for mainly mobile games and ports up to 2018, with a few Switch ports including Saints Row the Third over the last two years. Also, Deep Silver appear to have done the majority of the talking on this one, touting the game as a space combat sim. We see the main character Nara, or Nera, or Nera, and also her apparently sentient ship called Forsaken. But not much else apart from some ominous voiceover, stylish cutscenes, and a glimpse of some gameplay which frankly looks a bit like a mobile port. And then it's game number five. On to game number six, and again, another confusing one at first, with a spooky Christmas scene and some frankly excellent music choice, but then with a weird mix of Jesse Eisenberg and Tommy Wiseau dancing around some marionette corpses. I had it in my head that this might have been a darkness game until I saw a familiar face and realised what I was looking at. It's Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2. Now the gameplay is starting to look like it could be really fun, but time will have to tell with this one, as earlier reports stated that the combat and AI in this were... Eh, leaving a lot to be desired, so to speak. And this was coming from long-term fans as well. This was, however, much earlier builds, and the game has been delayed since then. So yeah, I am very interested to see how this one lands. This will be my first one for me, and I'm actually looking forward to getting my hands on it a bit more now. Game number seven is Call of the Sea. We've got another premiere, developed by Out of the Blue and published by Raw Fury. First reactions being that it looks, well, nice and indie. I had no idea of the type of game, so a little research has dug out that this is apparently an otherworldly adventure game. So depending on the type of adventure game this is, with the term adventure in gaming meaning anything from point and click to open world action RPG at this point, this could be one to watch. I personally hope for the more traditional adventure game, and with the tags on Steam listing it as casual, this might actually be what we get. And then game number 8 is another premiere, and it's one that really caught my eye, it's The Ascent. It's being developed by a team called Neon Giant and published by Curve Digital. Now this one jumped off the screen with its cyberpunk aesthetics. And yeah, we all saw the influx of cyberpunk themed content coming our way with cyberpunk prompting a bit of a revival. But I'm not complaining one bit as I love it in all its disheveled dystopian glory. And this is a great example, with some nice kind of grindhouse elements thrown in to provide some extra impact. Let's get it done! Which worked. Now I hope the aesthetics are as far as this goes for me, as this is going to be a looter shoot in RPG with an isometric camera angle, a la Diablo style. It's also going to have up to 4 player co-op, so as long as this has some interesting gameplay to it and doesn't just descend into a super clickathon chase for bigger and bigger numbers, I'm in. And game number 9 was a big one, another premiere, and another surprising one as well, showing baby bumps and tears and mourning. And snow! Snow's nice. Anyway, I didn't know what I was looking at and I thought it might have been set in Moscow, which shows what I know is it's apparently set in Krakow, Poland in the late 80s. Now there were definite Silent Hill vibes going on with this one, which it turns out is very intentional. It's been developed by Bloober Team, who fairly recently released the Blair Witch game and previously the Layers of Fear games. It's going to be a psychological horror game and feature the works of Akira Yamaoka, the composer for the Silent Hill series, which really got my spiritual successor senses tingling. It isn't, of course, with the game producer at Bloober Team, Jack Zeba, Cyber, Jack commenting that Silent Hill 2 in particular, i.e. the best one, that's being used as their specific major influence for the game, both in terms of tone and atmosphere, with Akira's work leaning heavily into that, and also the very Silent Hill dual realities. It's a very interesting setting for the game, with an oppressive environment, and it's going to apparently focus on having these two perspectives of the world around you, with our protagonist Maria seeing into the spirit world, which Jack described as almost a dark, hostile mirror of our world. It sounds like she'll see people's true intent and inner being, kind of the man behind the mask, and this apparently plays into the environments themselves too. So despite Maria's abilities, she's apparently hounded by this one vision, and the game follows her journey to try and uncover things in certain locations, which suggests that you'll be seeing what has happened in these places in the past. Now given the Silent Hill 2 influence, along with the imagery of blood on her hands and the pointing of the knife towards a midsection after the initial images, I'm thinking this may well explore some sort of internal trauma, perhaps one of Maria's own doing, but this is just pure speculation. 
a little on the nose to be honest with myself, so fingers crossed that story isn't lifted wholesale. Speaking of whole, number 10, The Scarlet Nexus, another premiere. It's by Bandai Namco, and I'll give you my actual notes. Japanese cyberpunkish, starting to look anime. Fucking flower monsters, there's the anime. Now I'm partial to a bit of anime, don't get me wrong. You just struggle to get any more anime than unstoppable, uncanny mechanical flower creatures. It's been said to be an action adventure game and brought forth thoughts of platinum game type hack and slashes, but to me it looks a bit more astral chain than near autonomy if you get what I'm saying. That being said, the funky alien botany beast with human arms and seemingly mechanical innards is reminiscent of Nier, and again the world aesthetics are mainly what grabbed me. They're calling it brain punk, which whatever, but it's apparently a mix of traditional anime and western sci-fi styling, so this could be right up my alley, so again, we'll have to see. And number 11 is Second Extinction, another premiere, and in this one we get a drop pod, a shotgun and thoughts of ODST, which really draws attention to the lack of Halo. So this is a squad based multiplayer built up from the tagline, EVIL MUTANT DINOSAURS HAVE TAKEN OVER THE EARTH! It's three player, with players choosing different characters which have unique weapons and abilities. I'm not sure at this stage if these will be character specific or not, or more data customization, but there are four survivors to choose from, and they're intending to add more post launch, bringing to mind thoughts of character shooters like Overwatch or Apex Legends. However, this is seeming a bit more left for dead or vermintide in my opinion, with what looks like hectic, visceral, all out action and a very busy screen. My main concerns with this one are pure speculation again, so really do take this with a pinch of salt, but looking at how the game is structured, this is giving off signs of a uh, live service nonsense. The game involves you choosing loadouts and selecting missions before heading planet side, completing the incomplete, and then extracting your teams back to base. It's there that you'll use rewards to upgrade and purchase weapons before being sent back into the wilds. Now this may well just be a nice simple premise, especially with this being a squad based multiplayer, it makes sense that they'd have a hope that serves as a lobby. Just be warned, although showing no signs of it at this stage, this format is ripe for Skinner Box progression systems and the not quite a thing of the past yet loot boxes. Either way though, despite looking to be more traditional in terms of movement and abilities, this has been built in Avalanche's own Apex engine, much like Rage 2 was, which, saying what you want about the game overall, the combat in that was mwah, so fingers crossed we catch some influences of that in here. Things look hectic enough to take it. Number 12 isn't a premiere, but it is a trailer for the new Yakuza game, Yakuza Like a Dragon. Now I'm not going to go into much detail here as this is a long running franchise which I'm yet to jump aboard, but these games are held in really high regard for good reason. They're effectively action RPGs set in a small but dense open world environment. Now this is traditionally Kamurocho, which is the fictionalised version of a district in Tokyo. This game however is going to be set in a new setting. So with this being such a long running and beloved series, I doubt I'm really going to do it justice without trying my hand at it first, so for now, just know that the fun, open world games with really packed and interesting environments, lots to do, lots of story, and lots of humour and irreverence, so if that sounds good to you, there's a whole series of this stuff, get on it! And finally we have Assassin's Creed Valhalla, here's that promised gameplay reveal, and technically I suppose that's what we got. Arguably it's a little subversive however as what we were shown was an in-engine gameplay trailer so by definition we did see gameplay. Let's be honest though this isn't what anyone was expecting. Gameplay reveal brings to mind gameplay demos, a quick show of someone controlling the way through a highly scripted sequence or something. But no, just a quick montage of in-engine cutscenes and a few cinematics to boot. Now my dissatisfaction with that may have jaded my point of view slightly, but I've got to be honest, this didn't look as graphically amazing as I was expecting. Now again, being a predominantly PC based channel, there was every expectation that this was going to look good but not exactly cutting edge, but it wasn't as good as I was hoping for. So I do hope this is more showing the folly of releasing a full cinematic trailer, followed shortly by game footage which obviously could never be on par with the cinematics. Couple this with the seemingly universal impression that this wasn't the gameplay that people were expecting, it's compounded the negative rather than boosting the positive. That being said, this is an extremely exciting game on the horizon, continuing on the groundwork set out by Origins and Odyssey, and expanding on those RPG elements. So this isn't intended to be a full rundown, or more of a glancing blow, but the most interesting part of this for me is the idea that you're going to get to get involved with the politics of the time. 
Creative Director Ashraf Ishmael, who served as Creative Director on both Black Flag and Origins, has stated that he'll be forging and breaking alliances along the way, which just screams Game of Thrones to me personally. He also said that the combat has been reworked and be more visceral and brutal, although I am pretty sure that's been said about almost every Assassin's Creed game since Ezio parkoured himself onto the scene. The RPG elements are here with gear and weapon progression. Now this has been present to an extent since Origin, so I'm assuming that they've expanded on this quite dramatically. But again, only time will tell, as this has only just been announced, so expect more info in the coming months. Now what we didn't hear much of was about the Xbox Series X itself. The main thing that they wanted to keep smacking us up the side of the head with was the smart delivery system. Now this is their business sounding way in saying that the games will be playable on whatever Xbox you have, be it the One or the Series X. They did also keep saying whichever Xbox you own or will own, but I'm sure it's just those two with just a bad choice of words. And my main thoughts here are always how much of this and other Xbox offerings are coming to Xbox for PC. Outside of that, not much was mentioned in terms of hardware and performance aside from the very general buzz phrases like 4K and 60 frames a second. Also, with 120 frames per second being mentioned in performance mode, those are frankly phenomenal numbers for a console. And again, the main feature, loading screens, were mentioned a hell of a lot, with Jack saying, and I quote, no loading screens in the medium. Also, both Robert and Ashraf have mentioned reduced loading times for both their respective games. And this is to be expected given the new SSDs the consoles will both be sporting, and I'm glad to see our console brethren joining the SSD party, but the idea of no loading screens is new and exciting, depending on how they achieve this, and how, say, conspicuous this may be in game. So to summarise, no Elden Ring, no Halo. But we do have another event coming up in July, where I think Xbox will be bringing out their big guns and first party titles for us to marvel at. In the meantime, not the best presentation if I'm being honest, but merit where it's due, Microsoft just whacked 25 minutes of game announcements and gameplay footage with minimal press talk and some genuine surprises. This shows Microsoft really taking steps away from the impression they set back when announcing the Xbox One and more in line with the community and game focused Xbox 360. Fingers crossed this will be good for the industry on the whole, so I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt for now. Don't fuck me over Microsoft. Again. So that's our takeaway, but, but what were your thoughts? Were you sat watching it along with me? Are you re-evaluating the term gameplay? Bit of an experimental one, so let us know what you thought down in the comments and please just keep in touch. Thanks again, hit the like button, subscribe, all the usual stuff. God this sounds tedious, but please give us a chance. Anyway, have a good one. In a bit.